Um, and the basic message is um, there is there is no necessary conflict. It's the same message we heard this morning from His Holiness, from Arthur, uh, between Buddhist philosophy and scientific procedure, because both are committed to systematic processes for getting at approximations of the truth with um, a clear understanding that there's always the possibility around the corner that some new evidence sure. will arise that will challenge sure. something you believe. I, Einstein was famous for having said, no experiment will ever prove me right. A single experiment can always prove me wrong. wrong. So it's, so I, I, and there's a kind of commonality of, of, of approach and belief in that. That's, it was a beautiful statement. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Your Holiness, um, is there anything you would like to say to your brilliant uh, student colleague in response to this presentation, and then we'll move along. Gave an explanation uh, particularly about the, the mode of inquiry, uh, the way we uh, seek uh, truth. And this is very important. <coughs> so, uh, in terms of the uh, consciousness, uh, various explanations of the consciousness, we have the Abhidharma system, we also have a tantric system where uh, various levels of subtlety of consciousness are uh, spoken about. Um, <coughs> In the, uh, in the tantric text, um, we, and they talk about <coughs> the necessity for straight physical postures you know, in order to have a, a clear and straight uh, um, concentration or thought. Um, if, your, if your physical posture is straight, then you know, the channels are straightened and the, the wind flows uh, smoothly and as such you know your uh, mind would be clear and so on so la uh, last year i um, remarked about this uh, paul ekman um, <coughs> paul ekman spoke about um, and 16 different mental factors uh, that are connected with anger that could be um, uh, perceived uh, uh, on one's uh, uh, facial expression. Um, in the uh, <coughs> in the uh, uh, lower Buddhist school of thoughts, you know, uh, fifty-one mental factors are spoken of. However, in those uh, mental factors, there are many. Um, uh, there are. Uh, uh, there are many mental factors that are spoken um, in the tantric texts uh, that are not explained in the, the lower uh, school. Uh, so, yes, Your Holiness, we have we have gone over time a little bit, but this has been a very very fruitful conversation. Um, I'm struck you are constantly generating these questions that are extremely interesting research questions, and it reinforces your interest in education because we need to educate many people who can work on these questions you keep producing. <laughs> we need a whole army of investigators. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Jimpa, thank you very much. Perhaps one joke I would like to, to mention. Uh, to express. Now I retired from political responsibility. So perhaps I may join uh, the group of researchers. <laughs> <laughs> you are very welcome, always. <laughs> you make yourself a guinea pig? <laughs> Control your dreams? Yes, if highly necessary, then of course. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh.
ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಪಾಸ್ಟಿವ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯೆನ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಷನರ್ ಸಿ ಅವ್ರ ಹಿ ಸ್ಪೆಸ್ ಹಿ ಡಿಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸರ್ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ಲಿ ಸರ್ ಕಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟ್ರೈನ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ ಅ ಹೀಟ್ ತುಮು ತುಮು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಬೆನ್ಸನ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಹಾಬರ್ಟ್ ಹಾಬರ್ಟ್ ಬೆನ್ಸನ್ ಹಾಬರ್ಟ್ ಬೆನ್ಸನ್ ಸೊ ಸಿ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಸಿ ಬ್ರಾಟ್ ಟು ಅಮೆರಿಕಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಮ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆರಿಮೆಂಟ್ ದೆನ್ ದಿ ರೂಮ್ ವೇರ್ ದಿ ಕ್ಯಾರಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆರಿಮೆಂಟ್ ವೆರಿ ಕೋಲ್ಡ್ ಸೊ ಇವೆಂಚುಲಿ ದಟ್ ಆರ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಕಾಸಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಇಲ್ನೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಷನರ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಡೋ ನಾಟ್ ವಾಂಟ್ fortunately this guinea pig survived no other problem no side pro ha uh, kasa healthy healthy no healthy, healthy. <laughs> guinea pig <laughs> yes now next thank you very much so next we will hear again from arthur zayans we'll change seats uh, and he will be making a presentation on quantum physics so continuing in many ways uh, where we left off this morning with his brief talk and giving us a kind of overview of this field and where it has come from and where it is now and how to think about it, this field of quantum physics, which is radically different from traditional physics. Testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Testing, one, two, three. A little bit louder. There you go. How is the translation? You're holding this before we uh, move on to quantum physics. I'd like to uh, speak a little more about Galileo. Hmm? <laughs> Because Galileo not only looked at the moon and the... Uh, planets and so forth, but he also was a student of nature on the earth, the experiments on the earth. And I'd like to speak about one very important experiment, one which also became part of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And I would like to uh, do this because Galileo uses reason, in some sense purely reason. Is it possible to gain insight into the world purely on the basis of thought? And here we see an example of his reasoning in a way that is like your reasoning and the reasoning of so many here, highly disciplined, very careful, leading to conclusions that then one can test experimentally, but in thought they are predicted purely on the basis of reasoning. Einstein was also such a figure who loved to think. Um, I, I'm going to do, uh, it's a little hard to see on the screen over here. Can you pull it up on the screens to the left and to the right? But I'm going to uh, demonstrate. Can you hand me one of those candies? Thank you, Crystal. So I have two objects here. One is heavy and the other is light. Mm. This is very light, this is very heavy. I'm not going to do the experiment. But I'm going to have you think about the experiment, namely if I were to drop mm. these two. And the question is, how would they travel? Would one go fast and the other slow? Would they travel at the same speed? What will happen? And can one, through thought alone, determine and predict what will happen? So I'm going to show it on the screen here. One possibility is that the big one goes fast and the little one goes slow. Another possibility would be for the two to fall at the same rate. Right? Now, I could take a vote. <laughs> and try to see what you think 
will the uh, will they go at the same rate, or will the little one go sl go slow and the big one go fast because it's so heavy? All right, you all have made up your minds. Okay, now we're going to do a thought experiment. We're going to reason our way through this, this just the way Galileo did. He's going to say, let's take these two objects, the candy and the bottle, and we'll tie them together and make a third object, one which is the sum of the two, all right? Which is heavier still. It's heavier than each of the three, each of the two. Will it travel faster still, or will it travel at the same rate? You tie them together, right? So then you have one object, but is now still more massive, still, still heavier. And you might think it will travel faster. But what if you take a string, a very thin string, a very, very thin string, and you tie the two together really very, very thin, do you have one large object or do you have two objects tied with a string? Will the light one, which falls slowly, slow down the big one? Or will they treat, be treated as a single object and fall quickly? You see? And he thought to himself, this is a kind of contradiction. The only way to avoid the contradiction is for them both to fall at exactly the same rate. And so he predicted... So can you... So? Okay. So what will happen is the two, one could fall fast and the other slow. You put them on top, you tie them together, you have one object that falls very fast. Or you take a thread, very thin, and you have now a, a light object and a heavy object. The heavy object falls fast, but the light one falls slow, and so it pulls and slows down the big the heavy object. Oh, So if the if the weight the 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 weight distinction between, difference between the two is big, then the the string might snap. Yes. But that's <laughs> then something's wrong. Then something's wrong, right? Yeah. So that's not the case. You could say, you take the two, you tie them together, you tie them together a little less, you tie them together a little less. When do you have two objects and when do you have one object? You see the, the contradiction? Yeah. With two objects, you might expect the heavy to go fast. With one object, it goes very fast, right? But now you take this one object and you make it back into two objects, step by step. What will happen? And so Galileo predicted, he said, the only way to get a consistent answer is for the small object and the large object oh. to fall at exactly the same, same speed. No matter how light this is, this could be a grain of sand oh. and this could be a very big stone. You let them go, they have to fall at the same rate. Leaving aside friction. Leaving aside air resistance. Yeah. Yeah. Which we're going to do. Yeah. 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 So what about if you do the experiment in an airtight chamber? Yes. If There's you do no the experiment. Here's the experiment. The cats and the dogs <laughs> run away. <laughs> he, des he describes the tower, this tower of Pisa. Yes, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He describes this experiment of taking yes. something light, something oh. heavy, dropping them, and they arrive at the bottom at almost the same time. And the question of air is a problem. If there's air, then does this right, doesn't does work does so does well. Does right. If we take a Kleenex and drop it, it'll... Oh. Yes, that's yeah. right. But if we do this experiment on the moon, hmm. that's right now. Hmm. If you do this experiment on the moon, there's no air on the that's moon. Right. That's right. And I have a photo, I have a film of this experiment being done. But, but you cannot see no air. 
So, very, very little I mean, air. The, you cannot say there is no air because there might not be the air that we are used to. <laughs> but well, if no you go there, which we, we've gone there, right? We've traveled there oh. by spaceship. Oh. And you see up here is a uh, image. See the images on the side. Here you have... So, for example, on the moon, if there is no air of some kind, according to its own local kind of, you know, laws, how would you explain the emergence of these mountains? Yes, but that is due to the heat in the center uh, of the Earth. Geology. geology. Uh, uh. It's geology, heat in the center of the Earth. Uh. And that comes through two factors. One is the pressure. Yes, when right. you squeeze something, uh. so very, on the moon very, also, that also on, the moon. on the moon, it becomes very hot. And then you also have impact yes. craters uh. right into the surface, which then throws up huge amounts of soil and rock. And you saw those craters through the telescope, those oh. round mm -hmm. shapes, right, right, right. right? In the middle of this, you'll find a, a huge stone mm. has come out of the sky or out of the it's space. Just a moving movement, moving side and on the way. Yeah, so, but there, there is some element of, you know, some kind of um, atmospheric kind of, you know, that allows the ability yeah. to move. No, you don't need atmosphere to move. Yeah, you can, and at least from the standpoint of modern science, you need just space. You don't need anything oh. in the space. It can be completely empty. Mm. Yeah. His Holiness is referring back to the Buddhist, you know, physical theory, which at, you know um, postulates that the ultimate constituents of matter are really understood in terms of the four elements which are really seen more as potentials rather than but the, the potentials that allow matter to be solid, to have cohesion, which is the water element. So it's the potential that makes it possible for material objects to have solidity. So that's the earth element. The potential that allows for the possibility of material phenomena um, you know, objects to have cohesion, like kind of a unity, that's water element and so on. So they're so really understood at a fundamental level, more like potentials. But his holiness is wondering, so how would that theory apply to the moon if there is no air and no movement? Yes. So from, from that level of so very, very subtle air, subtle. it must be there. Otherwise it's difficult. Well, can to one grow. perhaps resolve the debate by saying there isn't enough air to breathe? So there might be a little bit of air, but there's not enough air to breathe and the the that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's all what you. Oh. Do yes. So if you're in intergalactic space, you know, you're in deep space. There's always a little tiny bit of air. Right? Yeah, it's yours. And other matter, other not just air. Air is a very particular kind of gas, a very particular kind mm -hmm. of substance. Mm -hmm. But there are many others. But they're very, very, very thin. Yeah. And what they're thin enough is if you take a feather or you take a piece of Kleenex, mm. right, and you drop it in the air, it floats. Mm. If you take the same Kleenex and you drop it on the moon, mm. and you drop it on the moon, it drops like a stone. And I have a movie of this mm. that was taken in 1971, when the U.S. sent the astronaut David Scott to the moon mm -hmm. with a friend who had a video camera, and they drop a hammer, very heavy, mm -hmm. and a falcon, a falcon feather. Mm -hmm. All right, the feather of a bird. That's right. Yeah, they're going to drop them, and you can see <laughs> when they hit the ground. So if you'll watch the screen, I don't know if I can get the sound to work on this or not, but we'll try. Can the sound be turned up on the, my feed f that's coming from the computer back there? I don't know if you have that together or not. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago <laughs> who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his... Uh, findings on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here 
for you. <laughs> and the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two up here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. Did you notice how they hit the ground at the same time? Now watch them as they walk. See how they walk? They bounce around very slowly. That's right. That's right. Because the moon is so small that the gravity is very weak. And the things that they drop fall slowly and they themselves weigh very little. Right? Do you want to see that again? No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. His Holiness is asking the Buddhist colleagues um, in the Buddhist Abhidhamma taxonomy uh, the, the quality of um, um, lightness is categorized as belonging to tac tactility, tac tactile property, and touch. And same, same thing goes for weight, heaviness. Connected so to the sense of touch. Yes. So His Holiness is wondering why that is the case. So he's asking the monastic colleagues. I'm glad he's asking them and not me. His Holiness said that Jimpa did not translate it accurately. <laughs> You know, he's, he wasn't asking the scientist, but he was saying, oh. what, would, what would we say, you know, the Buddhists? What would we, the Buddhists, say, yes. So this is just a fact. We it's can fact, see. Yeah. Like that. Oh. So it's all because of that. Gravity. Gravity, no. Chazanga, Yama the Chio said, the D. Kasuri, Yam Sisakuan, Halam, Halam Shah, maybe. No, no, no. So Zolinus was saying that um, what this seems to imply is that actually the property of heaviness and lightness, you know, seem to be again contextual. You know, judging by yes, this, yes. you know, we cannot accept them as intrinsic properties of the things. That's very, very important. So the Buddhist scholars, particularly the, the scholars, you know, should not just rest at ease from the statements found in the text, but actually should subject them to inquiry further to try to see what was the underlying reasons for making such and such statement or attributions. Yes. Um, in fact, when the, the, there was a landing of the moon, His Holiness showed a photograph of the landing of the moon to one of the monastic colleagues by the name of Kishir Rabdin in, in Dharamsala. And um, you know, he said, maybe they ended up landing somewhere in the corner of Mount Meru. <laughs> 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 so, for example, if one is that dogmatic and, you know, kind of um, obstinate, then it would be very difficult. <laughs> yes. Well, this is an experiment I wish Your Holiness could make. You know, you looked at the moon when you were 10. Maybe now that you're a little older, you travel to the moon on the next station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh, this equivalence, this fact that the two drop really at exactly the same speed, exactly the same rate of, of uh, acceleration, we call it, has very, very widespread consequences. You know, and it's all the way into the modern physics, into the work of Albert Einstein, who likewise thought deeply about exactly this same issue. And from his reflections on this experiment, he came to the idea of his so-called general theory of relativity, his most profound contribution to physics, which really helps us to understand the largest aspects of the cosmos, the stars, the galaxies, and all of the rest. And this is from pure thought. Einstein did no experiments. He thought consistently. The way he characterized his thinking about this was 
what he said was his happiest thought, namely of falling out of a chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where you right. fall out of a chair, you become the bottle that's falling, and you ask, what is uh, gravity? Is it different than acceleration? And he came to the insight that these two things, gravity, which pulls us down, and acceleration, which speeds us up, have a very, very intimate relationship. They are, in some sense, the same. So this is Galileo to Einstein. The power of human thought is extraordinary. So in some ways, you already have the laboratory. You have the laboratory yes. right here, and you've been working with it for centuries. And it is powerful in ways which, even in the physical world, even in physical world, can be demonstrated and proved by these experiments. I wanted to end. Uh, you've already seen some of these pictures, so I'm going to skip those. And what I'm going to do is speak just for a few minutes about another aspect of physics. You talked about the elements of the Buddhist way of thinking, the Buddhist thought. Mm -hmm. You probably know that in the ancient Greeks mm -hmm. here in the West, they likewise had four elements. Right. Earth, water, air, and fire. Plato saw them actually as geometric forms, but we won't go into that. In modern science, we usually take the stance that we should look ever more precisely, ever more exactly, at smaller and smaller aspects of the things which constitute our world. So we look through a lens, the kind of lens that you might have in your reading glasses, and we see the object somewhat larger. Mm -hmm. You can take that same principle and create a microscope that's on the right, and the microscope makes what you see very much larger. So, for example, if you take a leaf and then look through the leaf, you see on the right-hand side the magnification of the leaf cells, and then if you'd make it still larger, you can get the molecular structure of cellulose, and then you go into the actual components of that molecular structure, and you find the atoms out of which that molecule is made, you can discover that there are about a hundred of these primary elements. Each one has its own character. Some are gas, some are liquids like mercury, some are solids, some are explosive, some are non-reactive. And they're grouped here in a way where the common properties are all in the same region. So this is a kind of map, if you will, of all of the ingredients that make up our universe. So, Arthur, what would you say is the relationship between the elements table versus the Greek conception of the four elements? Are, yes. are completely two distinct? Well, they're, they're distinct, but they're, they're the, the perception of earth, water, air, and fire as components of the universe is mm. very important. Mm. We would call them the states of matter, the first three. Solid, mm. liquid, mm. and gas. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah, exactly so, the same. So the, oh. how, what is the relationship between the period, period then table the, element? The, the relationship is that some of these here are solids. Some, for example, in this region in the middle, the ones at the ends, you can see, well, you can't see it very well, but these are all gases, for example. Mm. Uh, certain ones are metals, so a particular type of solid. Mm. Uh, and they're, they're put together here with these different colors to indicate yeah. their kind of families. Yeah. Related. Um, so this in relation to, say, for example, atoms in, in terms of levels of or reality. Than is, this is grosser than atom. Uh, elements can be, for example, uh, 
Here is what you would call the element of water. Uh -huh. In our case, we would say it's a combination of hydrogen and oxygen That's right. together, and it's all water. It's all H2O. Uh -huh. So you can have a lot of those atoms making up this volume, right? That should you tell me about it. many. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so that, that, uh -huh. uh, that each one of those elements there has a particular unique set of properties, you could say. You define each of these by its set of properties. Now we know that the properties which the chemists, the first chemists who came up with these different elements, we now understand this from the standpoint of still more subtle and smaller entities, electrons, protons, and neutrons, right? So you have the macroscopic world, it's analyzed into its elements, the elements each have unique set of properties. Then you can go and explain those properties from the standpoint of the structure of the atoms themselves. And then you can explain the inner structure of the nucleus by still more. Um, we, this would take us uh, a few more hours to get yes, sorted yes, yes, out. Yes, yes. But it's a wonderful uh, success, you could say, story which also, however, raises deep philosophical questions. Because if you continue this goal, and you ask yourself, mm -hmm. can I see atoms? Are atoms in some way palpable? One way of doing this is not by any longer trying to use light. Light is too primitive. It's not fine enough. And so what one light does... Is so what one does is, you know, if you, uh, if you close your eyes and you feel something, you can tell its shape, even with your eyes closed. Yes, that's right. Yes. And if your finger is fine enough, it can feel the structure of your palm, your hand. And if you're trying to detect single atoms, then you need something which is extremely sharp, extremely pointed, very, very fine. And here in this diagram, you can see there's a tip the tip is extremely fine, and then you bring it across a surface. The surface has a set of atoms, and then where it goes up and it goes down, you can make an image of this by computer, and you get the picture on the right. It's easier to see on these screens here. You'll see the picture on the right of the screen. It's produced atoms by running always your... Moving one way. Aren't the atoms constantly in motion? Moving. If they're cold and fixed to a solid, you can actually get them to have very little motion. Oh. Yeah, but you're right, mostly the atoms in this air, in our bodies, are constantly in motion. But as you cool them down, that motion becomes less and less. Heat, heat up to what, what, well, heat, beyond heat, what, what temperature? Heat produces the motion. Heat is, yeah. So his Holiness is wondering, in order for atoms to move, be in constant motion in their natural state, what level of heat would you need? I mean, how, how far you have to cool them down, in other words? Yes, well, if you use Celsius, mm -hmm. then you have to go 273 degrees is the end. That's Below. Minus, minus, minus 253. Minus two so what about if it goes really hot? There's then no it's end to the really oh, hot. I see. <laughs> That's right. I see. So in that case, for example, if we think of the atomic constituents of sun, of the sun, of the sun, sun will that be the same in kind with the one that con constitutes the Earth? The yes. basic nature is same, same it's, atom. It's the same, but in another state because it's yeah. so hot. Yeah. Right? It's the same basic material, but extremely hot. Oh. And in the surface, you have certain gases. Just like any, so that means they, the atoms are in constant motion up constant in the sun. Motion, yeah. yes. Very but slower. Motion. Fast, fast yeah, yeah. movement. Faster. Yeah. The surface of the sun, you know, could be at like 6,000 degrees. Yes. And as you go in, it goes into many, many, many yes. thousands of degrees hotter still. Yeah, so it becomes so hot that you have what we call a thermonuclear reaction. 
It's like with the hydrogen bomb. Right. right. Inside the sun, we believe that the same processes are going on constantly on a vast scale, creating heat and light. Now, with all deference to my colleague, Richie Davidson, who says his <laughs> topics are very interesting. <laughs> I think our physics is quite interesting, too. <laughs> okay, now I have one, la one last experiment. I don't know if you can see, but there's an arrow pointing to a person hmm? down at the bottom. That's yes. a human being. And they're inside the Large Hadron Colliders. That's the detector for a single experiment, trying to determine the fundamental constituents of the universe. So you have a, uh, a device, a piece of equipment that's larger than this building. And this is the equipment that's being used to do the experiments in this our is laboratories. The atom collider. This is a collider, yes. Yeah. This is right. Yeah. This is yeah. the most expensive scientific institute ever. This is the most expensive scientific yeah. It's billions of Geneva. dollars. Geneva. Geneva. Near Geneva. The one in Geneva. Oh, CERN. 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 Oh. CERN. 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 I have been, yes. I've been yeah. there. Yeah. You've been there. I think 73. Uh, there I, I learned the concept of quark. Quark. Yes. quark number one, number two, number three. Here are the quarks. Oh, then I think number fourth, or fourth or fifth, not yet find. Not yet discovered so at since that then, time. I think now because everything has been discovered. Almost, yeah. almost 30, 30 years has passed. So even the Higgs boson has been discovered. Then the sub the Higgs boson said the near I'm going to end this talk in just a couple of minutes. But I want to end it with a very different uh, set of pictures. Keep, in the Tibetan, keep going forward. Yes, that's right. Keep going forward in your... Uh, the, this is an image of the sky. You can see the night sky. If you wait and are patient, you'll notice that the stars move overhead if you go mm. out each night. Mm. What are you seeing when you see that motion? Are you seeing the stars moving? Or are you seeing the Earth move? Right? In fact, you're seeing the Earth move. Rotating when the sun and the moon set, the Earth is rotating. It looks one way, but we now understand it is another way. Now we've had a chance to travel with satellites, and probes into the solar system. The picture at the bottom here is an actual photograph taken by this, this uh, exploring, explorer here, this robot of the landscape of Mars. This is the rocket which took it all the way to Mars, taking many years to get there. So, I'm sorry, here's the photograph of Mars. You can take also that same type of system in the Cassini satellite and go by Jupiter or Saturn and take photographs of this remarkable planets. And out of the cosmic exploration that we've had, both from the standpoint of theory and the standpoint of observation, we now have a much fuller and more adequate understanding of the universe. However, there are always new questions, and I want to just mention a couple. What we've discovered recently is that only 4% of the universe, that's less than, less, than a, less than a tenth, less than a twentieth of the universe is made of normal matter, like this matter here. We don't know what the other matter is. We just know mm -hmm. it can't be the same as the matter that we know. Mm -hmm. So 96%, most of the universe is either what we call dark matter or dark energy. Also tomorrow, I'm going to talk to you specifically with Michel Bitbol about the mysteries of quantum mechanics. Uh, Arta, you might want to explain why, how did you... How did we deduce that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, is it because of the, the gravity? 
We, no, but you I, cannot account for. Yeah, so yeah. what you have are galaxies. Dark matter and dark energy are two different things. If you take a galaxy, which is billions of oh, stars. Oh, oh. Yeah. The galaxies. A galaxy, yes. Billions of galaxies. Billions so, of yeah. stars. Billions oh, of right. stars. And you watch it in its way in which it rotates. And you take what are the laws of physics and astronomy and you count up all of the stars and estimate all of the mass in that galaxy, you find that it's too little. All of your calculations, your best estimates and observations is too small. So there is dark matter holding that galaxy together through gravity. So compare that much easier. Exam experiment yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> Much closer. <laughs> Dark energy is a little harder. There you have to have supernovas, which are exploding stars. Right. And those exploding stars become like, well, we call them standard candles. They become a measure, they allow you to measure distances. And what we've found is that as opposed to the universe collapsing or slowing down, it's actually expanding at ever right. faster and right. faster rates. And so there must be a kind of anti-gravity, a substance which is an energy which, as it were, pushes things apart at very large scales, at very great distances. So you have in these two remarkable and recent discoveries, then the discovery of the vast majority of the universe, we don't know what it's made of. We don't know this new matter or the new energy. So there's still something to left for us to do when we come back in our next incarnation. <laughs> <laughs> you can be the physicists, and I'll come to uh, Great Pung. <laughs> thank you, you very much, Your Holiness. I've got it, thank you. So, Your Holiness, it's a great honor to be here. But as you have just heard, I am speaking on behalf of Professor Harrington, my wife. So she, pro she produced this talk. If anything in the talk seems wrong, it is my fault, not hers. I thought was. <laughs> so blame the messenger in this case, please. So the... <laughs> <laughs> you tricked him. So the task which, I, which Anne was asked to take on, and which I will now uh, undertake, is to summarize how Western science has tried to deal with the mind really since the beginning of Western science. So as we say on the slide, this is a very simple introduction to a very large set of issues. And I'm going to talk as a historian, and we will go very swiftly through time. There will be many risky generalizations, uh, but I hope it will be useful. And it, it will, I think, touch on many themes that have already been raised, especially your comments about various kinds of materialism older ones and newer ones. So I think the place that we want to begin this story is to understand modern Western science, which really grew up in the 16th and 17th centuries, as a project to understand material reality. And I think it is perhaps important to understand the extent to which that was a self-conscious decision by the leaders of early modern science. Uh, they knew what they were doing. They inherited ideas about the world from older Western sources, which combined what we would call mental and subjective ideas with what we would call physical and objective ideas in quite complex ways. This is true of the Greeks, it was true in the, what's called the medieval period of the Western world. And one of the key things that marks the emergence of modern science is a decision to stop doing that, to stop mixing ideas to do with the mind and ideas to do with matter, and instead to try to focus just on the material world and on things 
about the material world that could be measured. We've already heard reference to measurement and its importance. And so the kinds of things that early modern scientists were interested in were many. I mean, we've put up a few illustrations here, rocks and lightning and plants and animals understood as physical objects, stars and planets. Arthur has just referred to some of these. Even the human body. There's a famous experiment being shown at the bottom left of this slide, an experiment undertaken by uh, an English physiologist called William Harvey. He did the experiment on his own arm to try to demonstrate that the blood moves in a circle through the body, uh, through the heart. Uh, and it's an experiment that you can do on yourself, anyone can do. It shows actually that the blood only moves one way in the veins. And it always moves in the veins from further away from the heart to closer. It's always going this way, never goes that way. And uh, Harvey asked a brilliant question. If the, blood in the Ooh, I'm sorry. if the blood in the veins is always going this way, where did it come from? How did it get into my arm in order to come back in the veins? And although he could not see it, he concluded that there was only one way the blood could get out into the arm or the leg. It must go in the arteries and get between the arteries and the veins. You cannot see any connections between arteries and veins in a human body or in any animal. They are, the connections are too small to see. So as Jinpo was explaining, Harvey makes a hypothesis. He makes a theory that there must be connections between arteries and veins, otherwise the veins would all be empty, and they are not empty. So he infers the existence of a circulation by simple experiments on himself, but he is treating himself for this purpose as a purely physical object. And it's often been noticed that his primary theory for which he's most famous is the idea that our heart is a pump which is a mechanical idea. He takes this idea from engineers and applies it to himself and comes up with a completely new way of thinking about this central organ. So I want to suggest that this is characteristic of early modern science. And as we've seen, I don't need to dwell on this, the early modern scientists extended our understanding of the material world by extending their senses. So here is another picture of Galileo's telescope. I want to, because I'm trained in biology, I have a bias. So let us look instead at the left-hand side of the screen where we see a Dutch uh, biologist, if you will, uh, a man with an almost unpronounceable name in English, uh, Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, who is the first person to use lenses to identify microscopic animals in water, things he called animalcules. And you see him at work top left, and then at the bottom left you see a drawing of a flea made by the English natural philosopher Robert Hooke. Again, you, cannot, you can hardly see a flea with your naked eye, but through a microscope it's a gigantic thing um, and that, that is Hooke's. So there is immense curiosity here among these early modern scientists in all aspects of the physical world. But I just could not resist, we could not resist putting up a couple of images of the work of Isaac Newton, perhaps the most famous of the natural philosophers of early modern science. And it's just another illustration of using techniques to analyze the material world in new ways. And so he, among other things, among many other things, is famous for having used a prism, a piece of glass shaped uh, as a wedge, to examine the nature of white light, sunlight. And he showed convincingly for the first time that white light is a compound, it's a mixture of lights of different colors. And he was able to recombine the rainbow colors to make white light again. So, by the time we get to Newton, who is doing this work in the late 17th century, the new science is becoming quite self-confident because so many new discoveries are being made using these new techniques. But this all raises the question that 
uh, we really want to focus on here, which is, in the middle of all this, where did investigations of the mind fit in? After all, we're getting better and better at understanding the physical world, but what about the mind? And, uh, by the way, this illustration is just to illustrate, this is actually a medieval illustration um, of one medieval theory of the mind which held uh, that in the brain, the, the spaces, which are called ventricles, which are filled with fluid, are the most important things. And you see three ventricles there, which are believed at that time to have been significant, not least with respect to the location of the soul, the immaterial, immortal part of people in medieval Christian <coughs> thinking. So what, what is the answer to this question? The most famous answer to the question, where does the mind fit in for early modern science, is honestly nowhere. That's, it sounds a puzzle, but that's the most common thing one could say. Mind doesn't fit in because it doesn't seem to be the same kind of thing as the material world that we're becoming better at understanding. So is wondering, this is more of a historical uh, question, you know, when people are talking about things like nowhere. Yeah, but oh. so are they thinking, uh, I mean, are they, their conception of mind that they're looking for, is it still tinged with the conception of soul, which is a kind of a theological Yes. yes. Com uh, when I, when I, oh, sorry. Actually, if you repeat, I see, I saw. So, uh, consciousness, and I <coughs> Rim. Uh, identical. No, Rim. identical. No, no, no. no there's the mind consciousness in a soul. So, so his holiness is wondering, you know, when, say, for example, people concluded it's nowhere, I mean, are they thinking still in theological terms of the, the notion of soul, Man, many, mind as a soul? Many are. Rishan. There are complex ideas. There's no single idea. But many people have a theological way of thinking about this, and the concept of the soul is very important. And it's also important for the thinker on this screen, who is the famous French uh, natural philosopher and philosopher René Descartes. And Descartes is the philosopher who is very much part of like the... Tarim, tarim. So Descartes is famous for many things. He was an advocate of the new understanding of the physical world, and particularly for a kind of mechanical philosophy. And I will illustrate that in a moment. But Descartes wanted to remove completely from the study of the mechanical physical world any consideration of the mind or the soul. And he does this explicitly, so that we can at least understand him because he's very clear. And he says, basically, the world is made of two different things two different substances. There is the material world, which is now the province of what we call science, and there is the immaterial world of mind or soul, which has none of the same properties, and which is the province of something other than science. Uh, and this famous concept is often referred to as dualism, because it holds these two things so far apart. Um, so, this is not the only idea. I don't want to imply that Descartes' idea is agreed with by everybody. It is not. But it's a very influential idea. And it does... It becomes one radical response to the question, where does mind fit in? And the answer for Descartes is, well, it's a mystery, but mind only fits in, in very particular ways, in human beings, because we have minds and we have physical bodies. So somewhere in us, somehow, these two things relate, but apart from that, they don't relate at all. But now, he gives a specific plea for where He does, I, I'm, I'm coming to that, he does. Now, you just referred, Your Holiness, to the idea of the soul, and it is worth saying that I, Descartes' idea that the world of consciousness, mind, and spirit were separate, for some people this was um, if you will, a comfort. It was reassuring for religiously oriented people who could say, well, then our traditional beliefs about uh, human spirit, about human immortality, they are to do with this world of mind and spirit. 
and we can now accept everything coming from science, which is just only confined to dealing with the physical world. I've, this, is, this image is taken from a Scottish gravestone, and it's only there because it shows a, an image of the soul of the deceased person rising to heaven. So the wings and the head are the wings of the immaterial soul after death rising to heaven. So if you were a Cartesian, you could say, well, that's the spiritual side of the person. Their physical nature has died and is in the ground. Let it. And this, I do want to emphasize, this is a very radical view. So uh, as Christoph has just in indicated, Descartes thought hard about how the physical human body works. Uh, he's showing here on the left a diagram of what might be happening if you put your hand or your foot near a fire and you withdraw. And for him, that impulse is an automatic mechanical thing. It's purely physical. And he even shows a, on the diagram how it might work in terms for him of the flow of fluids through nerves to muscles, which might somehow cause the muscles to change shape. But you'll see that this all connects up into the head, and it connects up at a place known as the pineal gland, where Descartes thought the immaterial spirit finally made contact with the physical body. Um, and one of the reasons he focused on the pineal gland, he might just as well perhaps have focused on the amygdala, I don't know, but he focused on the pineal gland because it's a single gland where much of the brain is in two. And for Descartes, the spirit is not extended in space. It has no extension. So it can't be divided in two. So the soul could not connect through any of the duplicated structures of the brain. It must connect in one single place. And he chose the pineal gland. I want to emphasize this means that for Descartes, humans are fundamentally distinct from other animals. Because for Descartes, all other animals are simply living machines. They have no soul. And so on the right, you see his, a, a, a kind of diagram to illustrate how we are to think of a duck. <laughs> and it's not that he thought a duck looked like that. But he thought a duck should, in principle, be understood like that, that it's a series of machinery connected together. The duck is thought to have no consciousness. It is not, for Descartes, a sentient being. Only humans are sentient. Uh, Voltaire, later in the 18th century, would ridicule Descartes at, by saying, you know, so we are to believe that throughout the entire universe and the entire world of animals, they're all simple machines, but just we, five foot high human beings walking around, are somehow endowed with a completely different nature. And for Voltaire, this was absurd. So this emphasizes not everybody agreed with Descartes, but this was Descartes' view. Uh, and he took a similar approach to some of the issues we have been discussing even today. For example, thinking about vision. For Descartes, vision as a purely, what we would call, physiological process is purely mechanical. It's only when we come to bring our conscious minds to what we see that we can even think about consciousness. So you see a set of diagrams illustrating how the eyes receive uh, an image um, for Descartes and how that might be reflected in movements of the hand to point to the image. But only if this is a conscious perception Will the pineal gland be involved, at which consciousness in, is inserted? Now, I have said enough about, about Descartes, especially since my time is running out. The question is, what effect did he have? And Anne's thesis here for us to think about is that although people did not necessarily agree with Descartes, what he did was to push the problem of studying the mind scientifically into the background. So that for almost, well, for 150 years, it's possible to say, well, we get on with our natural philosophy and study the material world, and the mind is something different, and we don't know what to do about that. So in a certain sense, and a number of historians have written about this, you can argue, I think, historically, that some of the success of modern science in the early period 
by which I mean anywhere between 1600 and 1800, is bought at the price of putting the mind aside and saying that's a separate set of problems. Let's deal with that later. And it's only really in the 19th century, much more recently, that this set of questions about the mind start to come back. Because for all sorts of reasons, people argue that we can't ignore it and we don't really buy Descartes' view that the mind is completely separate. There were many reasons, I don't have time to describe them, why Descartes' ideas became less plausible, but they were always problematic. I mean, the biggest problem Descartes had, I think, was to explain how two fundamentally different substances could interact. How could this immaterial, unextended, uh, immortal substance, the mind, have any possible influence on this extended material corp body? And yet it's clear that it does. And he never said anything remotely convincing about how these two things connect. That was always a problem. But in the 19th century, there are many other problems arising. Uh, one of them is that ideas of evolution are beginning to arise, in which, for example, more people are coming to believe that animals and humans may be related, that we, we, we may, they may be our, our literal relatives, in which case it's even more surprising that we have a whole element of our existence which is completely unrelated to them. So in the 19th century, the problem that Descartes had solved with dualism comes back to be addressed in a lot of different ways. And because I only have a few minutes, I'm going to summarize those um, very briefly. First, it is worth saying that some of the attempts in the 19th century to understand the mind scientifically now drew on methods of introspection, which today we associate much more closely with, for example, the Buddhist tradition. So there was a whole school of introspective psychology in the 19th century, associated particularly with uh, a German psychologist called Wilhelm Wundt. And he tried to apply the same technique of classification and being precise to the study of, con sorry, of conscious perceptions that had been so successful in the study of the physical world. So the idea here is that you take something like any visual object, I have an apple here, and you ask the question, what primary conscious percepts might there be associated with looking at the apple? Perhaps its shape, perhaps its color, perhaps its uh, taste or its uh, uh, smell. And he would bring human subjects into a laboratory which looked like a physical science laboratory. It's a very big breakthrough for psychology now to do this. And he would um, give people uh, perceptual experiences, let them look at an apple, and ask them to report uh, as accurately as possible what their conscious experience was. And he was looking to find a natural classification of uh, conscious elements which went to build up our conscious experience. Um, Wundt himself was unconvinced by what he did. It was very hard to get consistency of reporting between individual subjects. And actually, quite quickly, introspective psychology uh, was subjected to heavy criticism. That's a picture of a man called J.B. Watson, who founded a much more influential school of behaviorism, which basically said, you're going to get nowhere by relying on introspection. We must stick with what we can observe. And so we observe not the conscious mind, but we observe. So Watson tries to shift the interest of psychology from introspected states of consciousness to observable behaviors, hence the term behaviorism for his branch of psychology. That is a second major attempt. Uh, I won't worry about the quote there. Psychology in the 20th century, um, experimental psychology, starts to do a great deal by way of setting human subjects various tests and tasks. This is another approach to the scientific study of mind, where you try to break down uh, psychological abilities, uh, such as memory and perception, language or attention, uh, into their constituent components by uh, by setting tests, which are usually uh, quantitative in nature, 
uh, and that gets a long way. Um, but as another scientist who has participated in Mind and Life, Steve Coslin, has observed, uh, I won't read the quotation. MIT job here. MIT wanted it. But uh, Coslin observes that one of the limitations of this style of psychology is that so long as you stick to the identification of psychological functions and how they work, you learn nothing about how they are represented in the brain. And so there has been a shift increasingly uh, in recent decades to trying to finally get back to that physical structure, the brain, and analyze, as you've been hearing from other colleagues, how that supports mental life and particularly conscious experience. Uh, so I don't need to describe this, uh, I think you know about this kind of work. This is an illustration of a much larger field, or maybe several larger fields, of modern uh, brain science, which use imaging, among other things, uh, to try to, uh, or recording of mental activity, uh, to try to associate particular uh, mental states with particular parts of the brain. There is a long history to that. It goes right back to the observation of the relationship between damage to the brain and changes in brain function. That image on the left there is a very famous one in brain science. It's the image of a subject studied by Pierre Broca, the uh, French neurologist, of uh, a man called Tan who had an inability to speak. And after death, he was found to have a, a big lesion in his brain. Uh, now known as Broca's area. So there's a, there's a consistent theme through a great deal of recent brain science, right the way from that work in the 19th century to the latest brain imaging work, which is trying to get more and more refined about the relationship between what is going on in people's uh, conscious uh, minds and what is going on in the brain. And others will speak much more to this. Uh, I, will, I will skip over it in the interests of the next talk. I just want to notice that this is all an attempt to produce a unified account. Uh, so the question that is raised by all of these efforts on behalf of modern science is whether after 400 years we are close or not to an ability to relate mental events to brain events in ways that would end this tradition of dualistic thinking. That's a question uh, some people think the answer to that question is yes, we are close. This is a famous uh, representative of that view, Patricia Churchland. I won't read the quotation, but she thinks that in the end it will be possible uh, yeah, Martin, to get a consistent... California, that might have been a job. Ah, yes. So, th so this is a tradition that she represents of trying to understand the mind as a function of the human brain. But she knows that many folk disagree that this will be possible. There are people out there who just are skeptical that this will ever be possible uh, on the basis of, of, of modern science. And we're still left today in a scientific perspective with what a lot of people call the hard problem, which is why we have the basic subjective experiences that we have. These are things that Anne likes to use to illustrate this hard problem. These are pet rocks, uh, which uh, apparently are sold and, of course, it's an absurd idea to have a pet rock <laughs> because you can't really have a relationship with a rock um, because it doesn't seem to be a sentient being. And, we, we, and even putting little false eyes on them doesn't make them sentient beings, really. Um, there's a philosopher in America who likes to talk about the problem of, of sentience by asking the question, what is it like to be that? And with a rock... I think we would probably all agree it's not like anything to be a rock. <laughs> you don't have any inner life that would allow you to say to be a rock is a bit like being this or that. We probably do have good reason to think that it is like something to be a bat or a bird. And actually, Nagel wrote a famous article about the bat to illustrate this argument. Uh, and it's still an open question in Western science whether the techniques we are using are going to end up enabling us to crack the problem of why it is like something to be a sentient being. That is still an open question in Western science. Thank you. So first, most basically, um, what is neuroscience? What are neuroscientists interested in studying? 
And at a basic level, it is the study of the nervous system in our bodies. So the nervous system um, includes the brain, which, of course, is what you hear most talked about. It also includes the spinal cord, which comes out of the base of the brain through your spine and is connected through many, many nerves throughout your entire body. So your brain is actually connected throughout your entire body. And the nervous system performs many extremely important essential functions for our lives. Um, it helps to maintain our, uh, our own bodies. So all the um, regulatory systems, breathing, heartbeat, digestion, fighting disease, all these things that we don't often think about are controlled by the nervous system. It also allows us to operate within our environment. So that includes taking in information through our five senses about the environment around us and then responding through behavior or other actions, uh, motor, motor actions, other behaviors. And in higher animals such as humans, um, the brain also is what underlies our thoughts and feelings, emotions, complex um, processes like that. So obviously the nervous system is an extremely important system for us to understand and John spoke a little bit about why uh, scientists believe that the brain is the main organ of the mind. So just to give some very basic information, um, a little bit of a tour of the brain for anyone who is not used to looking at it. Uh, the outer wrinkly part of the brain is called the cortex. Sorry, you still hear me? It's okay. And uh, the cortex is commonly divided into four different sections called lobes. Is it okay? No. Sorry. Uh, so the brain is divided commonly into four different sections called lobes. And there are many different functions associated with these regions. The frontal lobe um, is associated with motor control, uh, motor action, and also a lot of higher cognitive functions, um, such as evaluation, decision making, also regulation of our attention, language processes. And Richie this morning was talking about the prefrontal cortex, uh, the most frontal region of the brain. Um, and he was relating that to our ability to engage in mental time travel. So thinking of the future, thinking of the past, all of these higher cognitive functions happen in this frontal region of the brain. Behind the frontal lobe is what we call the parietal lobe. And this is involved in our sense of touch, touch perception, and also integrating uh, a lot of sensory information from other senses. On the sides of the brain are referred to as the temporal lobe. This is involved in processing our sense of smell and our, and our hearing sense, sense of sound, and also some visual systems of processing specific information like faces and scenes. And at the back of the brain is what we call the occipital lobe, which is primarily devoted to vision. It's a very important sense for humans. There's a lot of the brain devoted to it. Underneath this uh, large outer cortex is called the cerebellum. This is a specialized region that's involved in regulating your balance and um, coordination of movements. And it's also recently been understood to also be really involved in attention processes. And again, we see the spinal cord coming out of the base of the brain, which serves as the connection from the brain to the entire body. Yeah. So his holiness is... Um is aware of the, the fact that it has been discovered that um, even though certain regions of the or part of the brain is damaged over time, the specific functions of those damaged brain, uh, as a damaged part of the brain can be taken over by other regions. So with relation to, for example, speech. Um, so if the speech part of the brain is damaged and um, so, uh, I mean, are there any specific areas which are correlated so that function of that could be taken over by another f specific brain area or is it no, particular area or, or, or is it just an overall rem rem remedial process uh, well you don't have a mind well, <laughs> i think on the, on, on the age or uh, would it happen if it happens very early like in childhood yeah. there's some some children where they have a tumor and they the, the tumor is removed from the language let me say and they mm -hmm. stop talking but within a few months they can start talking again because they can transfer the language processing from the left to the right. But if this would happen in me, at my age, I would, I, I would not be able to recover speech. If I spoke here, if it's big enough, I would be left aphasic. I could not talk again. So, sorry, so my point is, that's... <coughs> 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 
So His Holiness' question is the following, that the fact that there is such a phenomenon is uncontroversial. But the point he's asking is, are there determinate sites which can take over the functions of specific damaged, specific part of the brain? See, another sort of part, uh, damage. Then, uh, not the area which uh, to, to kind of recover now. Mm. So his holiness is wondering whether are there, for example, if someone loses language as a result of damage to that language part of the brain, is it always the case that there is a specific part of the brain that can take over that function? No. no. The, no the, the, uh, <laughs> there could be multiple parts of the brain that could take over. So there's not a specific part of the brain that will, will always take over. It's also the case, Your Holiness, that in my opinion, and there may be some differences among scientists here, but there have been very few tests of the further limits of human plasticity. And to give one specific example, there is a very uh, important study that was done a number of years ago with patients who had a stroke where half the body was paralyzed because of damage to one side. And they treated these patients by putting the, the side of the body that was paralyzed in a whole body cast. So they immobilized the side of the body that was healthy. And they immobilized it for 16 weeks. So they, they lived in a cast 24 hours a day for 16 weeks. And what they found is that there was dramatic improvements on the other impaired side that they hadn't seen before uh, because the other side was, the, the brain was forced to rewire in a way which conventional treatments had not yet achieved. And so I think that this study raises the question about the, the limits of plasticity and what may be possible. Mm. ตัวยันยันดีอันนี้ตัวยันนั้นเยี่ยเลยอ่ะที่เจ็บเนี่ยยันกูไม่จับตัวหรอกแต่กูไม่จับหรอกมาจุนพลาสติกอ่ะใช
wondering how to answer your question. So another good question, but we must give the floor back to our speaker. Well, what I would just say is that we do know that there are fairly specific areas in the brain that are associated with function, but they are not absolute. There is variability, as an example, a person could have a stroke in what would traditionally be expected to cause aphasia or inability to speak, but in fact it does not do that at all. And what we see when we look at functional imaging is that their speech area is actually a little bit away from where we would have predicted. So there is this area of variability. The other interesting thing that we are now exploring is a concept of neuroprosthetics. We can actually put electrodes on the surface of the brain and teach individuals how to independently move objects, if you will, using computers that are connected to this brain interface. So there are some extraordinary possibilities there in the future, but as I think Dr. Davidson had pointed out earlier, based on the complexity of the brain, we are mere infants in our understanding. Okay. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、